Welcome to Season 2 of Inflammation Nation. My name is Gráinne O'Leary. Inflammation Nation is a podcast from Arthritis Ireland, aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of arthritis and related conditions. Regis Professor Roseanne Kenny is an award-winning physician and researcher who has been head of the Academic Department of Medical Gerontology at Trinity College Dublin since 2006. She is the founding principal investigator of the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing, TILDA, and has published over 600 scientific publications to date and was admitted as a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2014, Ireland's highest recognition for scientific excellence. She's also received a Lifetime Achievement Award for her research on ageing. Uh, you're very welcome this morning. Thank uh, you. Rosanna, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Grania. And I'm going to start off by asking you um, about what led you to pursue a career in this area. I was attracted to it when I was a junior doctor working in London in the then Hammersmith Hospital. And it was evident to me during a rotation through geriatric medicine that there was very little research or evidence base for treatments or understanding of diseases or disorders in older persons. There was a, a, a perception that it's your age, there's nothing that can be done about it. And of course, it was clear that that wasn't the case and that there was a huge opportunity for research. But, but also, I was very attracted to the aging person and loved the story, the narrative, the life histories behind that and the holistic approach of geriatric medicine itself. It's a very multidisciplinary discipline. So you engage with your nursing staff, physiotherapy staff and other uh, members of staff much more certainly then than other specialties. In fact, the closest to it at that time was rheumatology, which also had that multidisciplinary holistic approach to the patient. So all of those factors attracted me hugely, and I've never, ever regretted my choice. It's just my enthusiasm and passion for it has grown the more I've researched the area. And I suppose one of the things I hear more discussion about in recent times in particular is this difference between, you know, our chronological age and our biological age. Can you explain what that is? Sure. And, and again, that's something that we've really um, come to understand only in the last couple of decades. So chronological age is the number of candles on your birthday cake, whereas biological age is your real age, the age of your cells. And there's a huge difference in these two components. I'll give you an example. And it's an example of 38 year olds, because this is how early we've seen this disparity clearly. A lovely study, the Dunedin study in New Zealand, where they've studied a thousand people all born in the same year, and they've repeated all of the assessments every two to four years. When they were all aged 38, they measured a thing called a biological clock, the epigenetic clock, which is different ways we have of looking at the cell for hallmarks of the aging process that we can tell biological age. Remarkably, although everyone they looked at chronologically was 38, the biological age is varied from 22 to 48. That's a huge gap. So, and there were, then they, they of course explored what were the factors that were causing this acceleration in the biological aging process, even at such an early stage and, you know, poverty and poor education and poor health behaviors like excessive alcohol, drugs, smoking, etc. They were the, the, the factors which were accelerating aging even at, a, even at an early stage. So we're, we're very exercised in trying to understand exactly what the biological process is in even more detail. What are the drivers? Where, where along all of the different cellular pathways and signaling pathways is the change occurring to speed up the aging process biologically? And then is there a way that we can mitigate that? I've given you some of the um, triggers in, in that particular cohort, and it's been replicated now in a number of different samples. But uh, there is also a lot of activity in this space with respect to other ways of slowing down the aging process, including drugs, obviously, and medications, because we can't have always change socioeconomic status, poverty, education, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe if we can give a medication, it will mitigate or attenuate the 
terrible negative consequences of those sorts of environments. And what do you have to say about that, you know, that long held belief that our chronological age and our genes are the most important factors in determining how long we will live? Yeah, this, this is a great question. Mm. I mean, I, 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 I give an example of a mm. patient I had in my clinic. I do cardiovascular medicine and uh, he was 79 and he was smoking and drinking and he was obese. And so I decided to discuss with him all of these risk factors for his future, et cetera. And he sat back in the chair and he said, I have no need to worry, doctor. My mother lived till she was 90 and my father to 89. I have great genes. So the implication was that he could do what he liked. He didn't have to worry. <laughs> the truth mm. is that at the very best, 30% of our aging process is about our genes. The rest, 70%, and in some people, 80%, is all about other factors that we can control, like his smoking, like his drinking, like his dietary intake, like his obesity, they're far more potent and influential um, factors which modify biological aging than, uh, than genes. Now, if you make it to age 80, then your family history of genes kicks in and is more potent. But up until then, all of these other factors are far stronger influencers of how you age than your genes. And um why do some of us appear resilient to ageing while, you know, others seem maybe older than their years? Is it back to what you've... Yeah, I mean, um, by and large, it is the environmental factors. But, mm. you know, there are some really interesting c components within those environmental factors. At least I think they're really interesting. And, and they will probably chime with your listeners, but they may not have made the association before. Good friendship, quality friendships having a laugh, having variety in your life through friendships or other means, all of those factors actually slow down inflammation in cells and slow down the aging process. Isn't that remarkable mm. that we've evolved over millions of years from being a single cell into these complex organisms that is the human being and the importance of other people has evolved with us such that it leaves its mark on our biological aging. So, so social engagement is, is really important. Um, and laughter is part of that. Laughter, a good laugh has been used medically to um, accelerate healing after operations or after myocardial infarction, after a heart attack. Uh, it reduces the likelihood of having a repeat heart attack if, if people are, are shown funny movies that they laugh at. Even, even if you anticipate looking at the next episode of Father Ted, it's been shown that your stress markers, biological stress markers, are beneficially modified by that anticipation. So laughter is really important and friendship and social engagement is part of that. Creativity is important. And, and, I, and I guess I, I condense all of those elements by saying color in your life matters. So variety, mm. creativity, having a good laugh, friendship, all of those factors make a big difference. Um, so uh, I, I find it fascinating that the biology of aging can be influenced so markedly by things that we kind of take for granted and ha have up until fairly recently have been kind of referred to a soft science. Yeah, wouldn't put social, a value on it. Wouldn't put mm. a value on it mm. because, you know, you can't look at it under the microscope. But now actually we can look under the microscope mm. at all of those so-called soft elements and mm. see how they're affecting our biology. Mm. So moving on to Tilda. So mm. you're the founder and the principal investigator mm. on the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing, which is Tilda. Can you tell our listeners, first of all, what TILDA is? And I know, I know it's been going quite a number of years. Um, so maybe we'll start, start with that question first. So, so TILDA has been running for 12 years and it's a longitudinal study on ageing. Um, and what that means is we selected a random sample of people in Ireland over the age of 50. We did that by getting 30,000 randomly selected addresses, cold calling on those homes, asking if anybody 50 or more lived there, and if so, would they be prepared to take part in a study? And remarkably, 
we had a 68% response rate with that, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It was 2009. It was the start of the recession. And, and I think that that older age group saw this as a way of giving back to society in Ireland. And wow, have they done that? I mean, there. Have, so I'll, I'll just tell you the output from the study. You know, we, we, we've had hundreds of policy documents and mm -hmm. reports that have influenced policy, both here and and internationally. And, you know, over 500 research papers, original research papers, which have contributed to some of what we've already discussed mm -hmm. about biological and chronological aging. The study actually represents one in 156 people over the age of 50 in Ireland, which is fantastic. Yeah. And because of the way we've generated the data and generated the sample, we can extrapolate, we can generalize to the population. So if we have an observation about, say, how common arthritis is in Ireland from our study sample, I can with confidence say, and that is the case in Ireland as a whole because of the way the sample mm -hmm. was chosen. We go back to the same people every two years, and that's the longitudinal yes. component. And what the value of that is, is that by going back to the same people, we kind of understand better the process of aging. So if you can imagine, if a man joined our study aged 50 in 2009, and we've been reevaluating that same man over the last 12 years who had a stroke 10 years after he came into the study, we can go back and look at what were the elements and what made him different at the beginning and throughout the course of our assessments, which actually contributed likely to him having that stroke or dementia or cognitive impairment or poorer quality of life or depression or heart disease or heart attacks or high blood pressure. All of those things that evolve as we get older, we're by understanding the process of aging, and following the same people through that process, we're getting an awful lot of good insight in what, into what contributes to those outcomes. And the benefit of that is then we can say, OK, we know that these factors are likely to cause this in 10 or 12 years time. Therefore, let's work on these factors in middle, middle age to prevent that sort of decline. So that's what the longitudinal mm component is. We've been doing it for um, 12 years now, which is a very long time. And we're currently in the field refreshing the sample. Interestingly, we're not getting the same level of commitment or interest now. And I just think that's a social thing. I think Ireland is a bit different now. Mm. So when we're reapproaching households, because we, the, our, our 50 year old man then is now 62. So we want to refresh the sample with 50 to 62 year olds so that we can consistently keep informing government about important policy initiatives. And of course, they change with time. These times are very different mm -hmm. to 2009, et cetera. Um, but, but, but we're not quite getting that same enthusiasm to participate. Um, and if anybody's listening and you're being approached, please do take part because in terms of leaving a legacy and giving back to society in Ireland, and giving research jobs and other survey jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, employment is very big through the study um, to younger people. It's a great way of doing it. And in terms of, um, you know, more specifically uh, in terms of people with arthritis and, and maybe other rheumatological mm. conditions like mm. osteoporosis, mm. can you tell us a little bit about the findings from Tilda in, in relation to, to those maybe diseases? Sure. So one of, so about 40 percent of people over the age of 60 in our sample have some level of arthritis. It's almost ubiquitous, actually. And um, and we've asked about pain associated with that. Now, nearly all of that is osteoarthritis. Very small proportion would have rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. Pain in, in feet, walking, big, big issue, um, knees, um, neck and low back. They're the, they're the main age uh, areas that, 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 that people with arthritis experience pain. And uh, m many are not on any specific treatments for this. And we found that the, the level of pain does influence your sleep. And of course, sleep is really important for better aging. The other thing with respect to osteoporosis, which is one of the areas mm -hmm. you mentioned, is that of those who we diagnosed with osteoporosis through measuring a bone density through ultrasound, 
which we've done in everybody in the study, 67% of those who were positive for osteopenia or osteoporosis, they're the, 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 pre, the, the early stage of osteoporosis or the established stage, didn't know they had it. So we were able to give that feedback and we do that with the health assessments, feedback to individuals that this is an area. I call it a silent to. disease. It's definitely a silent disease. And of course, one in seven of those were men. So so it's it's not it's not only a female disease. Yes. I think that's one of the big policy and public relations things that we've been involved in in in, in disseminating to the public. And the second thing is it is silent and get checked after the age of 50. And I actually read, if I read this correctly, mm. that we in Ireland have one of the highest rates of osteoporosis in the world. So none of the other longitudinal studies worldwide are, mention, are measuring it like we are. OK. Um, you are right. But, but we're measuring things objectively and subjectively. What I mean by that is we actually do a test like the ultrasound to measure osteoporosis. And we also ask someone, do you have osteoporosis? The other studies that are part of this family of studies that Tilda is one of, um, they just ask, do you have osteoporosis? But of course, unless somebody's ever measured it, you're not going to know whether you have it or not. Mm. So it's a false, probably, lower prevalence in other countries. Okay. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So moving on to a, another topic um, in terms of loneliness and isolation. Mm. Okay. So um, we know that these are things that people can, you know, can affect people of any age, but particularly if people are restricted in their activities, maybe living on their own. And these are things that maybe can happen as people get older. Do you believe that those with arthritis are particularly vulnerable to loneliness and isolation? I, I do. And we've seen that. And I think that part of the reason is it may be difficult to mobilize. It may be difficult to engage with people and sit for long periods of time, for example. Um, and, and those two factors almost render an individual disabled in inverted commas and make it more difficult for them to engage socially and then more likely to be isolated. Um, and they may be also self-conscious about their inability to spend protracted periods of time in one position if you've got back pain or walking or other activities if you have other um, areas of involvement like knees or feet, etc. So, so there are some of the factors, I think, that might influence social engagement. Also pain. If, if you're having pain, you're disinclined to be engaged. You know, it, 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 your, your focus and concentration is elsewhere mm. rather than on, on, on lighter topics. So there are some of the reasons I think that we know that loneliness and social isolation is more common in, in, in persons with arthritis. And look, loneliness and social isolation is really bad because what it does is it exacerbates inflammation in the system, chronic inflammation. Now, inflammation generally is a very good thing because we have evolved to respond to body insults with inflammation. And by body insults, I mean a bacterial infection or a viral infection like COVID, whatever. So inflammation is a good thing because when something like that hits us, we get an inflammatory response and we get rid of it and we go back to basic and inflammation goes back to sleeping. But if you've got chronic inflammation and it's awake all of the time and rumbling in the background, that's really bad for our cell process. We know that arthritis is more common with inflammation. So if you have and inflammation is more common in people who've got loneliness and social isolation, so it can get into a circuit. Of, of one exacerbating the other. So if possible, it's better not to experience certainly loneliness, which is the emotional aspect of being alone, if you have arthritis. And if you do, you may be more likely to get arthritis in the future. So, you know, it's important to be careful about that. Having said that, the way our society has evolved and is evolving is making it really difficult to come up with solutions with respect to this. I mean, you know, I mean, it's OK from it's all very well, rather, for me to say it's not good for you. But if, mm -hmm. if somebody's listening and they're, they are experiencing loneliness and social isolation, mm -hmm. you know, what are the solutions for that? You know, I'm putting out all these negativities, mm. but what's the positive end of things? And it's so individualized, the response, that that I, I really think we need to come up with much more robust 
solutions for the individual on how to engage, how to participate, and also to make it easier for people to engage and participate um, than we do at, at, at present. Now, I don't have I don't have any magic solutions, but I very much like to get engaged with 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 policymakers or with with NGOs who are interested in actually specifically coming up with good, solid solutions for social isolation and loneliness. And of course, it's not just older persons or people with arthritis who are now experiencing this. You know, if you go into any housing estate, pre-COVID anyway, it like it emptied out during the day. Mm. There was nobody there. So if you happen to be living there, a mother with a young child in the house, you were you were on your own until people started to drip back from work. Um, and I suppose moving on, how important is it for those who have arthritis in particular, I suppose, to continue to maintain social contacts for their health and well-being? Yeah, well, we've, we've sort of said that yeah, and it, yeah. is, it, is, it is important. Um, and again, to remember colour. You know, purpose is something that we don't put enough of emphasis on, having a purpose in our day. There are, there are five zones in the world that have really informed a lot of the science of ageing. And the activities and patterns of behavior of people living there have really unmasked and unearthed a lot of potential science in this area. The five zones are called the blue zones. And they're in areas where, or they represent areas where a disproportionately large number of people live to 100 or more, but they don't just live to be centenarians or older. They live without the same level of diseases we commonly associate with getting older, like arthritis, like dementia, like high blood pressure, like heart failure. It's remarkable. So when scientists have explored what are the things in these blue zones which are leading to people apparently leading such longer, healthier lives, and it's been well validated factually that that is the case. Purpose was one of the things they, they, you know, they even had special names for having a purpose in the day. So they got up in the morning and, you know, reflected, OK, so what am I going to do today? What's my purpose for today? And feeling purpose may, may was, was something that they all shared. Friendship was also um, shared by all and intergenerational respect. Um, and one, one social scientist who visited Sardinia, which is one of the areas she visited a 101-year-old and was sitting in his kitchen trying to interview him. And she couldn't get a word in edgeways because so many people were popping into the kitchen to say hello to him. Mm. So the door was open. You had these narrow little streets, you know, and, and, and everybody who passed <coughs> popped in to say hi. He had children and grandchildren in yeah. the house. They were coming down into the kitchen all of the time. She said it was like a train station. And then it hit her. That's one of the things that's contributing to his variety, creativity, yeah. social engagement. Like he was going all day with yeah. all of this interaction. So, so that was one of the observations that shared in, in, in common with those, with those areas. So, so I think it, it is important to try and have a purpose in the day. And, and part of that purpose should be a conscious effort to engage with people somehow. N if possible, not to have meals alone, even if you share a meal with a friend online, on Zoom, mm, you know, mm. um, that's 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 also important. And the other thing that these zones shared, which which was an interesting observation, was de-stressing rituals. Now, they were all different. So Loma Linda in um, California, which is a group of Adventists, their de-stressing ritual was 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 a period of prayer together during the day. That's one. Um, the other was um, in Sardinia, where friends got together, four or five, six friends, and they'd have one or two glasses of wine over a few hours. And that was their de-stressing um, ritual. In Okinawa, in Japan, they'd have afternoon tea, generally ginger tea. And, they, and it was almost like a ceremonial tea to reflect and respect ancestry, etc., which, mm. oh, oh, which they shared with, with others. So... There were sharing de-stressing processes in many of these blue zones, which the researchers felt also was contributing to their healthier, longer lifespan. So these are things that I think that people with arthritis should reflect on. And they're, they're not 
You know, they're not heavy drugs. They're not expensive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they're kind of more difficult in a way because it, it is a it is a lifestyle change. So so uh, so uh, so uh, anyway, there, there's good there's good um, evidence around that. Well, you have seen a, a a big impact, you know, during the COVID years that we've had in terms of that loneliness and isolation. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming you have yeah. in terms of we actually we actually did a, a COVID specific tilde wave. So out with our normal waves every mm -hmm. two year of data collection, we did a special COVID data collection wave. We found that loneliness increased three times by threefold. So it was threefold higher and 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 depression was threefold higher during COVID. Um, and, and, you know, that's going to have both of those factors will have will have long term consequences. You know, it's not that they're not they're not to be taken lightly. And and that means that at a societal level, we need to be doing even more to engage with people because very often once people become socially isolated or lonely, it's terribly hard to break out of that cycle and to find solutions and resolutions for change. And even even now, I think a, a lot of people are still feeling intimidated by gatherings, by crowds, mm -hmm. by going out, etc. So so we, we need to work on that. And of course, depression is not good if one has arthritis um, because it's a trigger also for inflammation and can exacerbate as, 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 as anyone with arthritis will know. If your mood is poor, your symptoms of pain are worse. Mm -hmm. And, and I suppose linked to that then is this whole area of remaining active. Um, so I suppose how important do you think it is, um, you know, for people with arthritis to remain active, you know, to be able to engage in exercise and, you know, and what can we do to help someone who may be living alone and is not as mobile as they'd like? You know, is there any particular type of exercise that they could undertake? So, so, so first and foremost, there's no doubt that the two major determinants of successful aging are exercise and diet. Now, I know that's old hat. And mm. I did say this once during a, a radio interview and the interviewer said to me, oh, my God, not those old chestnuts mm. again. Mm. But I mean, that they are the facts. That's the way it is. So with respect to exercise and arthritis, first of all, of course, yeah, um, you, one has to t tailor the exercise according to whatever joints are involved, etc. So heavy weight bearing exercise is not appropriate if you have lower back or lower limb arthritis. So you have to make sure that the that your exercise program maps your own disorder. Secondly, uh, but I mean, that's that's easily feasible. There, we, there's so much out there now with respect to particularly resistance exercise programs that can be done without putting weight on the axial skeleton. That's your mm -hmm. spine or on specific joints. Um, there's three types of exercise and maybe people would just reflect on this and then see which suits them best. Aerobic exercise is the one we know most about. And that's where we just kind of the commonest recommendation is to walk at a speed that you get breathless if you try talking. So mm -hmm. that's what we mean by brisk walking. And if you can do that, now that might be very difficult, of course, with arthritis. But if you can do that, that's a good form of uh, aerobic exercise. 30 minutes per day, five days a week. So that's a total of 150 minutes of that sort of brisk walking, i.e. aerobic exercise per week. So that's the first recommendation. The second is resistance exercise. This is really, really important and it's particularly important for people who suffer from joint discomfort. Resistance exercise is weights or putting a, putting a resistance strain on muscle groups so the muscles have to work harder. Now, we lose 1% of muscle mass per year over the age of 40. So that's quite mm, a bit, it's considerable, right? Considerable, yeah. And Aerobic will help it, but resistance is the solution for that. Um, so unfortunately, um, we, we, we're not very inclined to do resistance exercise. And from our own work and that of others, seven at the most 10 percent of people over the age of 50 do regular resistance training programs. That should be up to 80 percent. And there's no reason why people with arthritis can't do Again, tailored exercise resistance uh, programs. So it's very important. 
And another form of exercise, which I think is quite fun, where there's been some really interesting studies on, on recently, is eccentric exercises. So it's kind of a resistance program, but it's using the opposite groups and much less of them, but bigger muscle groups than you would expect during aerobic exercise. And the best example I can give you of eccentric is going up and down the stairs. So going up and down the stairs we, we, is aerobic exercise. If you're going quickly mm -hmm. up the stairs, say, say, say two flights of stairs. But you get a very good benefit from coming quickly down the stairs. You're using a different group mm. of, of, of muscles, but it's been well established now that that improves bone density and muscle strength, as well as heart rate and the other beneficial cardiovascular components of exercise. So eccentric exercise is important. And if you're doing weights as part of your resistance training program, you know, say you lift a weight up, okay, then when you're coming down with the weight, that's the kind of easy bit. And we're inclined to do that quickly. Mm. But actually, if you do that very slowly, that's also eccentric exercise and you're working different muscle groups. And the reason it's thought to benefit us biologically is because it causes little micro tears in muscles which we don't normally, aren't normally involved in, in uh, resistance or weights. And, and they trigger a local inflammatory response and that increases the muscle bulk. So back to what I said earlier, we lose 1% of muscle mass per year after the age of 45, 40, 45. So these three components of exercise will compensate for that. And then there, there have been some studies showing that protein supplementation and certain amino acids also help to compensate for that 1% of muscle mass, like whey protein, which, mm -hmm. which has a number of different amino acids. The specific amino acids are leucine, isoleucine and valine. But it's really hard to get those individually. And the easiest thing is to, to use the whey protein, preferably an organic one that you see young, your younger counterparts using in the gym all of the yeah, time. And sure. we assume, oh, that's for, you know, that age group, yeah. young bulking men and not and not and not our age group. But in fact, um, we need it just as much, and probably even more. So so provided your kidney function is 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 normal. I would recommend taking protein supplementations. I take them myself. So when it comes to exercise, there are lots of reasons why people with arthritis should try and identify an exercise program that suits them and know that those three types of exercise that I've mentioned are each very valuable. Okay, and for people listening that are you know, are listening to your message about the importance of, of being active and uh, incorporating exercise into their, you know, their, yeah. their daily lives, but who maybe aren't doing any of that at the moment. Yeah. Have you any advice on how they get started? Yeah, that's a great. Because it can seem, you know, yeah. it can seem quite overwhelming. Oh, I need to do aerobics Absolutely. and I need to do resistance and I, you know. Absolutely. So, 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 so it's, so any introduction of regular exercise is better than none. So from, from this moment on, <laughs> Um, try the try the walking. Of course, that's something we can easily do. You don't feel like it. You're tired. You're sitting down. You're watching television. And just say, okay, I'm just going to do this for half an hour. I really don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it. And you do it, and you come back, and you feel refreshed. So you know, tr try the brisk walking. I think the best way, if you can afford to. Uh, do resistance exercises is in a gym. We, mm. we, we, our gyms should be peppered with people over the age of 40 uh, working out regularly, 40 to 110. The most, so that's, so that's mm. what I would suggest. And I would say after the age of 50, just get it into your head. I'm going to do a little bit more exercise every year after the age of 50. But for those who, you, as you say, might feel very disheartened and they're not doing anything, do you know what? It's never too late. There's loads of studies showing no matter what stage you introduce exercise, you can show a change in biology that's beneficial. So don't be disheartened. No matter how little it seems, it's, it's hugely important. Um, and, and, and if you can join a gym and get somebody to take you through a resistance program of exercises, knowing your, your disabilities, that's money very well spent. Um, and then the remember what I said about eccentric. So don't take the lift. 
go up the stairs mm -hmm. and come down the mm -hmm. stairs as fast as you can. The other thing we didn't talk about was balance, which is also very important in mm. this context. So falls become much, much more common yes. as we get older and particularly in the context of arthritis. And, and uh, having good balance really matters for that. So you should be able to stand on each leg for 30 seconds, eyes opened, dead still. And then for at least 10 seconds, eyes closed um, on each leg. Now, uh, a lot of people who aren't working on balance can't do that. But if you do it if a couple of times a day, practice it by the sink, washing your teeth, whatever, uh, it, you, your, your muscles involved in balance will be stimulated and awoken and become stronger. And it, it, good balance is a really good way of preventing falls and falls become so common as, as, mm. as we get over 30 percent of people over the age of 60 fall at least once a year. They're the commonest reason for fracture, by far the commonest reason for a hip fracture. And we all know how debilitating yes. a hip fracture can be. I mean, nearly half of people who get one never return to their previous level of lifestyle or independence. So. They're, they're, they're huge. So balance is something that we can work on. And again, you might say somebody hasn't been doing it and they're listening and they're thinking they're the lost cause. Absolutely not. Balance is something that we can start working on now and make stronger within a couple of months. You'll notice a difference if you do that. And um, is the, the exercise example you gave there, is that really a way of, of I suppose, starting to improve one's balance? Absolutely. And in fact, that's probably all you need. Just stand on one leg with eyes open, but eyes closed as well. I'll explain why the eyes closed is important. Three things govern our balance. Our balance center in the brain, our vision, and also sensors in the feet and ankles called proprioceptors. Now, we can overcompensate for deficiencies in our balance center in the brain and in the proprioceptors by vision. But if you take away vision, then you'll find out what's really going on with your balance centers and your proprioceptions. And they're what you need to work on. So if you're not good with balance, eyes closed, if you can't do it standing on one leg, eyes closed for 10 seconds or more, then you need to work on it. And, and practicing it, you will find bit by bit you're getting better. What can we do for ourselves and what are your top tips, you know, as a society to ensure that we have fulfilling, happy and fit long lives? So I would say color. Mm. And I would say color in your life and color on your plate. That's the quick, you know, mm. uh, elevator pitch, color. Mm. So color in your life covers everything we've talked about in terms of variety, friendships, creativity, purpose. Color on your plate. We didn't talk about diet, but mm. just, you know, p people were being bombarded with diet all the time. Most of the blue zones are predominantly plant based, but color, color, color. So color means variety and not processed foods, no processed. So if you can remember no processed and color, that's a great diet. And that that that's a diet that will lead to a healthier, longer life. Color. Rosanne Kenny, thank you very much for, for joining with us today. Thank you. That's all from this episode of Inflammation Nation. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Stitcher, or as they always say, wherever you get your podcasts. For further information about arthritis, you can visit our website, arthritisireland.ie or contact our helpline on 0818 252 846. See you next time. Inflammation Nation is supported by Pfizer.